different. Hi, everybody. My name is Mary Burley, and I'm the chief educator at the Norman Rockwell Museum. And we are so happy to have you with us today for our first tea and talk regarding um, a topic we've been looking at all week. Our topic is heroes. And, um, and in particular, we've been thinking about healthcare providers on the front line. And so with us today is Stephanie Plunkett, who is our chief curator and uh, deputy director, and also Dr. Marcella Bradway. Dr. Bradway is the chief um, chair of surgery at Berkshire Medical Center, and we could not be more delighted to have her join us and uh, both share um, insights from the front lines right now in Berkshire County, Massachusetts, where the museum is located, um, but also to reflect with us on some of Norman Rockwell's images of doctors and uh, doctor patient relationships from the 1920s to the 1960s. Um, Stephanie has a wonderful collection of images that we will be talking about uh, as part of this. Um, we're drinking tea. <laughs> and yes, and we're drinking tea. So we just wanted to start by letting you know uh, that this is an interactive experience and regardless of what channel you're on, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or Facebook Live, um, we are taking questions and uh, really invite you to type questions in and, and they will come to us and we will make you part of the conversation. Um, our first question to practice that uh, routine is what kind of tea are you drinking today? And I'm going to start with asking Stephanie, what's your tea of the day, Stephanie? You know, today, Mary, I have a classic Earl Grey tea and a flowery cup. And uh, I am a tea drinker, for sure. So tea is an, always a really important part of my day. How about you? What are you drinking today? Well, I'm so glad you've got some real great. I have uh, in my, a cup my grandmother gave me 26, or actually 30 years ago. Um, uh, I'm drinking Paris tea made by Harney and Sons, which is my favorite. And tea is, also, is just a great part of the day. Um, Dr. Bradway, do you have a favorite tea? I have a couple actually. I'm a tea drinker as well. Um, and in the morning I usually drink uh, organic decaf English breakfast. Oh. Uh huh. And then in, later in the day I will oftentimes have iced tea and I like uh, the honey green tea, organic honey green tea. Okay. Sounds delicious. <laughs> You're uh, conscious of caffeine. You're all for organic and uh, def definitely on the health side of this equation. Trying. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, Okay, so uh, so our run of show today is that we'll talk a little bit about what this is. This is the introduction right now. Uh, and then, uh, then we'll hear from Dr. Bradway, and then we'll go into looking at um, a number of images by Norman Rockwell. And so we're very excited to do that. Um, Dr. Bradway, uh, I think all of our listeners and, and visitors today are particularly interested in COVID-19, what you've been up against, and uh, what you're noticing um, in your own practice and for the larger community. Well, the first thing I'll tell you is I, I will describe a little bit about our hospital in case there are listeners that may not know much about Berkshire Medical Center. Um, Wonderful. Berkshire Medical Center is, is the major hospital in um, our county um, and we're really one health system in this county so we have to provide all of the medical services for the population of Western Massachusetts. Um, for someone to seek help outside of our county they would have to travel an hour to either um, Albany or Springfield. So uh, we take our mission extremely seriously in terms of providing all of the medical care that this community needs. And that includes um, general medical care, intensive care unit um, uh, services, surgical services, trauma services, um, anything that is needed um, for the community, cancer services, uh, radiation oncology, um, all those types of things that would be very difficult for uh, the um, population to have to travel to access those services if they were to go to another health system. Um, and so 
with that in mind, you know, we are, um, we have been fighting COVID-19 here since uh, mid-March at this point. Um, so five, five to six weeks. Um, pretty quickly, we were one of the first uh, places to have a COVID-19 patient. Um, and we saw a pretty large um, increase in the numbers of patients initially in March. Uh, we actually peaked uh, with our cases um, at the end of March, and we are sort of in a holding pattern right now at Berkshire Medical Center. Um, as you might imagine, uh, this is a, a hospital-wide initiative to fight this pandemic. Uh, there is a meeting that occurs throughout the hospital every single day. We have been in a constant state of what we call an Annex P. An Annex P in the hospital is Annex Pandemic. And what that means is you are mobilizing administration, you're mobilizing all of your resource management people, you're mobilizing all of your people who um, run your facilities, the people who clean your facilities, doctors, uh, head doctors, head nurses, and all of the department chairs all coming together to try to make sure that we have what we need to fight this pandemic. So every single day we have a meeting, we talk about where we are, we talk about the supplies that we have, what's coming up, what we need to do. Um, and so we're tracking, we're tracking the cases that have occurred throughout the county since we saw our first case. And what we're seeing is that we're sort of a little bit of a plateau at this point. Um, so far in Berkshire County, I will tell you as of today, today's numbers um, that we went through today at, at our meeting, um, we've had 386 people test positive for COVID. Uh, to put that in perspective a little bit, we've tested more than 2,500 people. Now you have to realize that the test itself is not 100% accurate. So it's actually only 65% accurate. So some of those negatives may actually be positive. But then we've only tested people who've had symptoms for the most part. In some areas we have tested asymptomatic people, but for the most part, um, the Department of Public Health has guided us that we have to um, test people who have had symptoms. So we've tested over 2,500 people and 386 have been positive. Of those, um, only 74 have ever been hospitalized. So I think that puts it in perspective. You know, most people in the community are recovering from this illness without coming into the hospital. Um, and then since the um, end of March, we've basically had between 20 and 25 COVID positive patients in the hospital. And now it's a 250 bed hospital. Um, we oftentimes run a census around that. We can uh, have more patients than that. And we've had a census of about 150 to 160. So to put that in context, a small portion of our in-hospital patients are actually COVID positive, and they are on special units and they are in rooms that are negative pressure, meaning um, that the air is, um, is uh, pulling into that room and it can't come out of that room. So the hospital is a very safe place to be. And a lot of patients, you know, other illness does not go away in the middle of a pandemic. We still have patients with heart problems and lung problems that are not COVID uh, and still require hospital care. And those things are continuing to happen in the hospital just like they always do. But we are seeing that we've uh, sort of plateaued a bit in, in terms of we are having between 20 and 25 patients a day. And if you kind of look at this on a graph, I think we're starting to see that uh, plateau and we're seeing a flattening of the curve. Instead of seeing a big spike, we're starting to see a flattening of the curve, which means that all of the work that the community has done to um, social distance and stay at home, uh, and no matter how painful that may be in, in so many ways, has really helped to not overwhelm our hospital system. Uh, we've been able to manage the number of in-hospital patients. We've been able to manage um, the ICU patients, the patients on ventilators, um, and we have not maxed out our ventilator capacity um, as of yet in this pandemic, and obviously we're hoping that we won't. Uh, the first couple of weeks when we saw a surge of cases were very, very difficult, I will tell you. We were definitely uh, taxing out our staff, um, and it has we call it our new normal. It's like you deal with a certain number of COVID patients and we, and we can at the moment handle it, which is what the mitigation is designed to do, of course. It sounds like an extraordinary amount of problem solving for you yes. and the whole team at the hospital. Yes. And also that you're dependent on uh, citizens, every citizen in the community to participate uh, for this to be successful. Absolutely, that's correct. 
Yeah. Um, as you look forward, uh, one of the things you know, we're all wondering about is um, what can we expect and what is the science behind uh, decision making uh, as we, we move, we hope, towards um, reopening over the next weeks or months or whatever the time, timeline ends up being? Yeah, I think that we have been hampered a bit by our lack of ability to test. Um, mm -hmm. And that has been um, a problem of supply. Um, for instance, we are currently have a low supply of the swabs that are needed to do the test. Mm. Um, so our supply chain, um, and not just Berkshire Medical Center, but everywhere throughout the country, um, is hampered by the lack of testing supplies. And what it means is that we're flying a little blind. We don't really know exactly how many cases that we've had in the community. Um, we know that we're learning about this virus all the time. It's a new virus. We're learning about uh, the people who are asymptomatic who can transmit the virus, which you know was not really recognized initially. Um, and so we haven't been able to branch that testing out to asymptomatic people. We also would like to be able to test to see if someone um, has had the virus. So if someone has had the virus and they've fought it off, then they should have antibodies, immunity, um, in their system. And we know that people do have immunity because we're using the blood of patients, the, the, the antibodies uh, that, we, that we filter out of blood of patients who've had COVID and who've had, who have recovered to treat COVID patients now. Um, that's being done throughout the country and it's just started to happen also at Berkshire Medical Center. Um, so hmm. it's, it's plasma therapy. Um, so we know that there is immunity. We need a good test to know if a person has had the test and, can, and, ha and the, those antibodies are in their blood. A really good test at the moment that specifies COVID-19 versus other coronaviruses. And you have to remember that the common cold is a coronavirus. So we've probably all had a coronavirus multiple times in our lives. So you have to have an antibody test that's specific for COVID-19. And that is not widely available as of yet. When it is, which I anticipate that it will be, um, sometime soon, and when I say soon, I mean weeks, if not, you know, maybe a little bit longer than that, then, and if the test, if we have the, the supplies that we need to test, that's really what we need to do. We need to test the community and find out who's immune. That will give us a lot more information about when we can open things up. If we know that 80% of the population is immune, that's a whole lot different of a scenario than if, if you think that only 20% of the population is immune. So science is a really, science and expertise are critical components of the long-term solution. Absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Well, it gives me great comfort, and I'm sure for many of our listeners, all of our listeners as well, that um, we have you in the community helping and, uh, and that you are looking out for all of us. Well, I have to tell you, I've been a very, very, I feel like a small part of this. Um, you know, it's really our emergency room staff, doctors, nurses, and, and aides, um, the intensive care unit physicians who are pulmonary critical care doctors who have been taking care of the most critically ill members of this, uh, of this uh, pandemic, um, our medical docs, our, our, intense, our um, internists in the hospital, and our infectious disease specialists in the hospital, and all the nursing staff that take care of COVID patients. Uh, they're the ones who are truly on the at very front lines of this. Dr. Bradway, you mentioned um, in our earlier conversations that um, nursing homes were presenting a challenge with regard to fighting this illness. Right. And I don't know whether you'd want to touch upon that a little bit. Sure, not all of them, but certainly some of them have been um, hot spots for, uh, for the virus um, here in the community and elsewhere um, in Massachusetts. Um, you know, about the Holyoke Soldiers Home. Um, and I think because those residents live um, in those facilities and are cared for by a similar group of people, um, and we know that they're older, so they're more vulnerable to this virus. It's a particular uh, group of people who are vulnerable to this particular virus. Um, then, you know, it is unfortunately a setup for these areas to be hot spots. I think that's recognized very well now. Um, and I think a lot of the processes in terms of how patients um, are handled 
the masks, gloves. I mean, we're all wearing, I'm not wearing a mask right now, but when I'm in the hospital, I'm wearing a mask all day long. Uh, and all of us are, secretaries, everybody. We're trying, in case we're an asymptomatic carrier, we're trying not to give it to other people. And that is something that was sort of late to be recognized, I think, um, at least in this country. Um, and so I think we could have done a lot more. And of course, that now that all is happening in the community, which is really starting to mitigate the spread everywhere, including in the nursing homes. This is an incredibly um, wonderful update. Uh, I think it's really helpful to know and hear that some of the measures, many of the measures, there's so much active problem solving going and the social distancing measures are working uh, as people practice them. Um, there's a framing question that just came in on Twitter from Jenny. And I think as we transition to talking about paintings, this will be a really fun question for us to think about. The question is, um, how would Rockwell paint this crisis? What are our ideas on that? So uh, I think, Stephanie, with that, I, I think if we keep that question in our minds, we can come back to it. Um, and in the meantime, there's some incredible images here to talk about. And, and Stephanie, um, I'd love to uh, invite you to start that conversation. Absolutely. Well, that's a wonderful question because it really ties into um, the type of work that Rockwell did throughout his career, uh, which was really to present the most, uh, in certain ways, positive portrayals of sometimes very difficult situations. Mm -hmm. And um, what's interesting, of course, is that throughout his career, one of the themes that comes up over and over and over again is this interaction and communication uh, and connection between the doctor, especially the family doctor, and his or her patients and the community. So I think um, you know what we're going to do today is explore a little bit of uh, work that he did that really exemplifies some of those ideals. So what Rockwell is really doing is he's showing not just the treatment aspect, of course, um, the curing of illness, but the sense that the connection with the physician is really part of the cure because it brings a sense of goodwill, of peace of mind, um, of clarity and understanding in terms of what is actually happening. Uh, because as we all know, when there are medical issues, they can be disconcerting uh, and confusing. Um, but Rockwell actually gives us the sense that the medical professional is a generous, caring individual. And What's fascinating, of course, is that his images were circulated by the millions, and this sense of who the medical profession was and the individuals who populated the field, uh, I think really permeated the American psyche and made people feel very respectful um, of doctors, which is wonderful, uh, and you know, I think in terms of what their personal experiences may have actually been, um, the paintings actually gave a sense that uh, there was this wonderful opportunity to have a caring professional on the other side of the, of the desk. And I was wondering in terms of Dr. Bradway, um, were you aware of Norman Rockwell's images as uh, you were kind of coming up and do you have a sense of whether they might have given you a feeling of what it would be like to be a doctor? Oh, definitely. I mean, I grew up in Pittsfield and um, we used to make um, pilgrimages to Stockbridge a couple times a year um, and go to the Red Lion Inn for lunch with my mom and my grandmother. We used to do that. We used to go to uh, the museum and we're very, I mean, I remember my grandmother and my mother just being proud of having Norman Rockwell um, having been part of our community. They were just really proud of him as an artist. And so I was very much aware of his paintings, absolutely. Well, I think it might be fun to get your perspectives on some of the images that we're gonna take a look at. And the first one is actually on the screen. Um, it's a really wonderful 1947 painting uh, done for the Saturday Evening Post. And it is actually in the Norman Rockwell Museum's collection. And uh, when we open, anybody can come in and, and see it. it. It is physically on the walls right now. But it's called Norman Rockwell Visits a Family Doctor. 
And um, before we look at some of the details, I'll just mention that this painting has some really special resonance because the doctor who you see here, who's kind of leaning in so closely to that family, uh, is Dr. George Russell. And that was Rockwell's doctor in Arlington, Vermont, where he lived for 13 years. And not only did Dr. Russell treat Rockwell, but he treated his wife, Mary, and their three sons. And so uh, he had a, a really special place in the Rockwell family. And so, um, Dr. Bradway, I'm wondering, in looking at this picture, are there things that you notice that might reflect changes in the medical profession uh, through the years, maybe since mid-century America? Well, I notice changes and consistencies, both. Right. Yeah. Obviously, the change is that we don't see patients in our living rooms. <laughs> So we see patients in our offices, which don't look like that. Boy, I kind of wish my office did look like that. <laughs> There's not dogs involved, but occasionally there are, uh, uh, you know, guide dogs. Uh, and uh, definitely not guns on the wall either. But <laughs> um, well, your head maybe, right? <laughs> exactly. But what I do notice, um, and, and I've really tried to do this throughout my career, I try not to have a desk or a piece of furniture between me and my patient. And you'll notice it in this patient that, in the, I'm sorry, in this painting, that's exactly what uh, his physician has done. He's put his desk off to the side and he is directly talking to his, his patient, um, who I'm assuming is the child and the mom, without a physical barrier between him and, and, and the patient. And I do that in my office as well. I have never had a desk between myself and my patient. And I frequently, as a surgeon, have patients come in with a significant extended family. It can be, you know, um, a husband and wife and their kids, um, and we'll always bring chairs into the room, and it can be a big group of people uh, to have the conversation that we need to have. And I, I try very hard to have that conversation in the round, very similar to this painting, so that nobody feels like there's some barrier between them and, and the doctor. So like here, you're really becoming part of that family for a period of time and, you know, really a very trusted member of the family who they count on, for sure. Because right, what they want to know is, are you going to take good care of my loved one? That's what they want to know. And before I go into the operating room, I say, I know this is your husband, your wife. I'm going to take really good care of them like they were my own. And I really mean that. And I think it's an, that's what they really want to know. Are you going to take good care of my loved one? But if, there's, if there's one thing this painting shows, it's, it's really a celebration of that trusted relationship and the fact that it's an observed relationship within the family. Yeah, the body language of the physician, he's leaning forward, he's caring, he's inquisitive and interested, um, and the parents are concerned. Yeah, it's, it's, yes, it's a very great embodiment of the relationship between the physician and their patients. Yeah, and in this, in this case, even Bozo the dog is there. <laughs> that was actually Dr. Russell's dog. <laughs> and Rockwell received letters to say, why do you have a dog in a doctor's office? <laughs> very and he basically wrote and said, well, you know, nothing was the worse for it. So it was kind of all okay. <laughs> um, I'll just mention a fun fact which is that if you notice above Dr. Russell's head, there's a photograph. And actually there's a lot of personal mementos in here that give you a little background on Dr. Russell, but uh, it happened to be a picture of his daughter who was an army nurse during World War II. And there was a reader, this is how closely people would look at the artwork. A reader wrote to uh, the post to say, I think I recognize that person. And um, the post, researched it. They asked Dr. Russell and Dr. Russell said, yes, my, my daughter was a nurse during World War II in England uh, where this gentleman felt that he had encountered her. So people were looking very closely at these pictures and, and really getting ideas from them. Uh, the apparatus in the, on the right-hand side is, has quite a story. I, I find that totally fascinating. Do you want to share a little bit about Absolutely. I don't know, Dr. Bradway, do you, have you seen a device like this on the right-hand side near the window? Uh, maybe in a museum once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look familiar. 
familiar. Uh, well, in researching this a little bit, we discovered that uh, it was actually a machine, an electronic device that helped the doctor to remove warts. Oh. So um, I guess it kind of uh, burned them off or whatever has to happen. <laughs> but it was, um, was an interesting element of the picture, for sure. It, it takes a lot of real estate, and you wonder how much of this practice was, was about removing warts. <laughs> Exactly. Um, well, I guess I that, guess that's an interesting thing about uh, practicing at that time, because doctors were perhaps a little bit more um, broad in what they had to treat. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. Would that be true, do you think? Oh, definitely. And a lot of the general medicine guys did, and they were mostly guys, uh, did minor surgery. And they did uh, appendectomies and they, you know, a lot of things that are pretty much in the realm of surgeons nowadays. Right. Should we move on to the next, Mary? I think so. Okay. So this is a fun picture because it, it's another one that falls into the realm of personal for Rockwell because this is a doctor uh, who was Rockwell's doctor, but this time in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, where he lived for the last 25 years of his life, starting in 1953, and it's Dr. Donald Campbell. And um, Dr. Campbell, as I understand it, because I certainly did not know him, was quite charismatic in town. And uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Dr. Bradway to tell her story in a minute, but um, this was done for the Upjohn Company, which was a pharmaceutical company that focused on um, vitamin production. And Upjohn was actually established by a man who um, figured out how to create what's called a friable pill, apparently, a pill that um, could carry vitamins that did not just pass right through your system, but that would dissolve. So I don't know, it's just an interesting fact. But Upjohn hired Rockwell to present, you know, this very empathetic view of the family physician who, as you can see here, has made a house call. Um, I don't know if anybody out there remembers house calls, but I do, uh, even in Brooklyn, New York. And um, what Rockwell said was that if he could give this painting a title, he would call it a case of schoolitis. <laughs> because if you notice what's happening, uh, the doctor is not the only one looking really carefully at that thermometer. Uh, it's also the little boy who's being treated. So um, does this bring anything to mind for you, Dr. Bradway? Uh, I had a lot of schoolitis. As <laughs> 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 and apparently I was still able to go to medical school. So <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> oh, no, it's a great painting. It really is. Uh, it's, it's wonderful. <laughs> Mary, you had some fun observations about this one. Do you want to share? Yeah, I, um, I, I was really, I'm interested in this one as a former teacher and also a principal and the conversations always about whether people are sick. But uh, what I loved about this image is the relationship between the boy and the doctor. Um, clearly the boy, there's something up with the boy and, and likely he has schoolitis. Uh, but the doctor is not taking a position, an authoritative position. He's sort of in the game with the young man and preserving that doctor-patient relationship. And it, it feels to me like they are going to figure out how to talk to the, the authority figure in the house about what the situation is. And the boy is not gonna lose any face. Um, and yet he also might have less schoolitis in the future. And so I, that's the feeling that I get from it. Um, and some of the clues that I love are the boy's hands on the doctor's shoulder, uh, they're parallel, um, their faces together looking at the thermometer, they're in this together. Um, so I, I just love that part. I also love the clues that it's at home, the comfy quilt. And um, I, just, I just think it's a wonderful image. I think also Dr. Bradway, when I look at this image, I think about, um, tools and, and, and science and how great that we have thermometers and how they're still being used today and an important part of, of um, how we make decisions. Absolutely. 
And I'll just mention on the right hand side, um, you'll see that there is a study for this painting, which is actually in the Norman Rockwell Museum collection, not the painting, but the study. And um, if you notice the expression on Dr. Campbell's uh, face, uh, um, Dr. Campbell's face, he's looking, I would say, a little more skeptical in the drawing <laughs> than he is in the painting. He's, got, he's a little more even, as Mary said, in the painting. He's more part of the game, so it seems. But um, it would be very typical for Norman Rockwell to do detailed drawings before committing himself to canvas in most cases. He was a very methodical painter. I, we think of him as a thinking painter. And there was really never anything in a Rockwell that wasn't there for a very good reason. There's this, another, whoops, I'm, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry to break in. I will, we're figuring out the flow, but there's another couple of questions that have come in. Oh, good, good. I thought before we move on, we should, we should, this is a neat one from YouTube, um, from Laura. And the question is, is it possible the boy is related to the doctor given the affection the boy has for the doctor? Um, and I think I have a response to this, but I'm curious what you think, uh, Stephanie. You know, I think what I love about Rockwell's work is that we bring our own stories to it. And mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of uh, open-endedness in, in the work. So even though his paintings do tend to tell a complete story, um, I think we can imagine into them. And uh, that's the beauty of it. I think we come up with our own thoughts about what he meant. <laughs> I agree with Laura, there's this tremendous affinity and I, and I guess I tend towards thinking he's celebrating uh, that privileged doctor-patient relationship and how special it is. And in this case, it does feel almost familial because it is, but it's really a story about, to me, it's a story about um, doctors and patients and and that special bond. I don't know, Dr. Bradway, what do you think? <laughs> I think that that uh, little boy could have been my husband because because <laughs> Dr. Campbell was his doctor. <laughs> There you go. Does he have any recollections of seeing Dr. Campbell? Oh, very much. Oh, a, a very um, important part of their lives growing up. Yeah, he was revered in the family, I know. I never, mm. unfortunately, met Dr. Campbell myself, but I've heard so many stories from the family. <laughs> and our colleague, Rich Bradway, who's um, working behind the scenes today, was also a patient of Dr. Campbell. And I think he's going to come on at the end and tell us a little bit more about that, which will be fun. So let's see, I think we'll move on to this wonderful piece a little bit earlier in Rockwell's uh, body of work. So this is uh, Dr. and Dahl from 1929. And um, what I love about this is that, the, is that the base of the story is this wonderful close connection of a medical professional who is willing to put his expertise in service to a child. So we see he's actually taking time to examine the little girl's doll. She's actually taken the doll's dress off. If you see in the painting, it's uh, being held underneath her arm. And uh, he's listening very carefully to what's going on. Uh, but the best part about this is we have a wonderful story um, several years ago, I was, I just happened to be in the museum galleries and there was an older woman um, being pushed in a wheelchair by her daughter and she had a box in her lap. And she asked me if I worked at the museum and when I said yes, she said, I am Rosemary Hunter. I am the little girl in Doctor and Doll. And in this box, I have the doll, which I, which I kept all these years and I'm donating it to the museum. Oh, wow. And it was amazing. Um, so we got all excited. And what's even better is we, we found a photograph of her on the right, uh, posing in Norman Rockwell's New Rochelle, New York studio with the doll and with an actor, a local actor named Pops Fredericks, who appeared in a number of Rockwell's paintings. Um, and so the other thing about the photograph is it's one of the earliest known photographs that Rockwell took as visual reference. Mm. So there's some fun things here um, to think about. Uh, 
What do you two think? Any, any observations about the painting or maybe how the painting compares to the photograph? Um, I have to say, this is one of the paintings that I remember as a child. Um, mm. And then later on in my career, when I did my pediatrics rotation in, um, in medical school, these were the types of things that we used to do to try to get kids to allow us to examine them. You know, we would try to either examine mom or dad first, because oftentimes, you know, a small child will not let you listen to their heart and lungs unless you, um, you work up to it. So these are the types of maneuvers that we would do <laughs> to try to uh, have that child allow us to examine them. <laughs> oh, that's so interesting. I wouldn't have thought about that. That makes perfect sense. Great. <laughs> I love that, and I think I think also what what comes up for me in this um, image is I, I love comparing the photograph and then how Rockwell uh, uh, both both copied the photograph but also made a few changes. And I love how the girl in the painting, um, although her stature is a little smaller, she's standing up even straighter and taller uh, than in the in the photograph, and she's. Now, I guess what I take from that is she's really putting on her best foot and most respectful uh, uh, posture for this moment. And, and I guess, again, to me, it's another celebration of that doctor-patient relationship. She's trusting her most um, treasured possession uh, and, and looking to the doctor for advice. Uh, so I, I just love that. The other thing I notice about his uh, pictures of physicians is you'll often find books, uh, the doctor's bag, um, mm -hmm. you know, certain equipment, like we see the stethoscope here. And these are all symbols of the professional lives and the um, expertise, I think, that the doctor has. So those things keep coming up. And this is a beautiful illustration from 1938. Again, I think giving this sense that the um, family and the doctor are truly united, even as a physical group. Um, this was a piece that Rockwell did for a story illustration in the Saturday Evening Post in 1938 by Stephen Vincent Benet. And um, when uh, Upjohn was seeking uh, some illustrations, uh, they had seen, someone had seen, one of their representatives had seen this piece in the Saturday Evening Post and um, was really taken by it. And uh, eventually Upjohn purchased the original painting as well as the drawing, uh, which you see on the left-hand side, which is quite complete. And um, Mary, you were noticing some distinctions between the drawing and the painting. I don't know if you want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I, in this case, I was just so moved by uh, the emotion and the feeling that comes through in the charcoal drawing in particular. And, and it's the opportunity to compare the two, I think, is, is quite wonderful. Um, one of the things that I wondered about, first, it's a very beautiful depiction of Rockwell's wife, Mary. Um, which especially comes through in the charcoal. Um, but I wonder if part of this story is that Mary is um, concerned about her son and she's called the doctor in the middle of the night. And if the clues to that are in the rumpled, um, the rumpled jacket and, and maybe that's medicine in his um, pocket. Um, but it almost looks as if he's come fairly quickly from somewhere and maybe not with a whole lot of time to be totally um, put, to, uh, put together. Um, as it, every other case, the doctors look very put together in his, in his images. So I, I don't know if that's what the story is, but that's what comes up for me. Of course, Rockwell did have three sons and um... You know, at this time in 1938, uh, he would have had at least one of them around this age. So, you know, I, I always think there's a lot that's autobiographical in Rockwell's work too. Mm. Um, Dr. Bradway, anything come up for you in looking at this? Well, the other paintings were a little bit more on the whimsical side, um, whereas this painting strikes me as a kid who's sick. Yeah. Um, so it's a little different. It's a little, a little bit more serious uh, than the other ones. 
Um, and, uh, it, and, and I think maybe because the, the child is not looking at us as well. I mean, that's the other part of it. You're not seeing mm -hmm. the child's face. Um, and, and you are seeing the rumpled clothing. It, it seems to me like he's got an illness. There's, there's a little more urgency. And, and Mary looks very beautiful, but also worried. Yes, worried, but trying to reassure the child at the same mm -hmm. time, trying to let the child not see the worry. Mm -hmm. And yeah. all of us as parents have done that, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, very beautiful and poignant work. And uh, I think now we get to something that's a little bit more on the humorous side, as you were. <laughs> as you were mentioning and that's the beauty of Rockwell you know he has this ability to be a caricaturist to um, paint something classically beautiful and serious and then of course to bring humor to a whole range of topics including a child's visit to uh, his doctor and uh, of course another element that keeps coming up are diplomas diplomas actually or degrees appear in some of his medical pictures and um, I don't know, Dr. Bradway, do you have your, do you have your uh, citations on the wall in your office? I do. Do you want to see them behind me? <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's great. That's a lot of them. <laughs> do you ever see a patient leaning over to try to read them? Uh, no, actually, not usually. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen that. But as you see, I've got some pictures, too. <laughs> exactly. Not just. Not just diplomas, you know, and too much of that kind of stuff on the wall. <laughs> so similarities as well. I love that. Uh, this too is actually Dr. Donald Campbell. And um, it's also one of our, our favorite local uh, Norman Rockwell models named Eddie Locke, who lives in the area of the museum. And uh, fortunately, Eddie will come by every so often to tell his personal story. But what, what was great about this is that Eddie tells the story of coming into Rockwell's studio to pose and um, being very uh, embarrassed to have to be dropping his pants, but he said that his pants were not dropped to this level at all. <laughs> that Rockwell, in emphasizing his point that this um, kid was about to get a shot, um, you know, kind of dropped them down lower. And, and Eddie said that going to school after this was published was an absolute nightmare for him. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that was a little bit tough. But of course, what's interesting, I think, is that um, not too many years before uh, this was painted, penicillin came into being uh, during World War II to treat uh, soldiers' illnesses. And of course, uh, the polio vaccine was distributed widely as of about 1954, I think. So it would have been a very relevant subject in people's minds at the time, and it actually remains quite relevant as people debate this issue of inoculation. I don't know, Dr. Bradway, if you have any thoughts about that. You mean about the issue of inoculation? Or the painting, or anything you might want to talk about. <laughs> oh, I, well, I think it's an adorable painting, and, and this is I think the most famous, maybe it's just because, um, you know, in, in my husband's family, they, uh, they always point to this painting and I think that they may have uh, known the uh, young man who posed. <laughs> um, but I, I love it, I really do. And I'd like to invite our colleague, Rich Bradway, um, who's kind of been behind the little Norman Rockwell logo square, if he'd like to reveal himself, there he is at Command Central. I and, uh, say a little bit about either the painting or your experience with Dr. Campbell. Uh, so you all can hear me right now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Campbell was definitely a fixture in town. Um, much like the first image that you showed of uh, Norman Rockwell visiting a family doctor, um, most people would talk about Dr. Campbell sort of as two people, but basically one and the same in that he was an everyday kind of person that you would see in town at the post office or whatnot, at the library. But he was also the place, the person you went to uh, if you either had a checkup or you weren't feeling well. And um, I certainly remember going to, uh, his office was in his house uh, on uh, West Main Street. And um, you would go into the house and I remember, um, 
I don't remember as many chairs like this in his office. Most of them were sort of sitting in the hallway right outside the office. Um, I do have to point out that I'm the youngest of three boys. And oftentimes I would have to go either because I had an appointment or my older brothers had appointments or my parents had appointments. And what I would say, and this is, I'm going to embarrass my brother, Jeff, Marcella's wife, is that uh, my brother, Jeff, had no tolerance for pain. And whether it was Dr. Campbell or Dr. Devaney, who was our dentist, and Lee, um, there would always be some sort of noise or yelling coming from the office. And I'd be sitting outside uh, wondering what was going to happen to me. Um, but Dr. Campbell was always was just really a gentle soul. And um, the one other thing I'll say about this is that uh, this particular image, um, I think it was in 1978, so I would have been eight or nine years old, or it would have been 83. So it would have been the 70th or 75th anniversary of Hillcrest Hospital. And they wanted to uh, sort of reprise the scene for the cover of their I guess it was like a newsletter or a newspaper or maybe even a magazine that they had for Elkhurst Hospital. And so I was requested to be the model to play the role of Eddie Locke. And um, it was interesting because it's the mid to late 70s or early 80s. So I had considerably more hair on my head than Ed has there. And um, I'm, I'm a bigger person than Ed is even now, even, even then. And so uh, what I can tell you is that it was just an odd sort of situation, but it was fun. Um, I will say that um, they took a picture, they didn't paint it, and I can tell you, I didn't pull my pants down nearly that far of <laughs> that photograph. But uh, if anyone has the magazine, you'll probably find it on the cover. Um, I would love to see it again, just because it is a memory that's burned into my memory, but uh, that's, that's what I have as a memory. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing that memory. It's wonderful. Jeff just texted me and he told me that he remembers running around Dr. Campbell's office avoiding a shot. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Maybe he was the inspiration for this painting. <laughs> we do have another question that came in on Twitter. And that is, um, this is from Bailey. And the question is, how is this crisis affecting illustration art? or the production of new art in general. And I guess I would just like to add to that, as you think about um, how we're going to get through this time in history, Dr. Bradway, what are some of the images that you would like to see produced to help people understand um, how we can be a community facing this together? Well, I have to say, I've been um, taking a lot of pictures because mm -hmm. I will see things that just strike me as being so different. Um, and one of the pictures I took fairly early on was a picture at the hospital cafeteria where the booths had, um, you know, yellow tape across them. You can't sit in the booths. And a bunch of the tables and chairs had been removed from the cafeteria, so it essentially forced social distancing. Um, in the cafeteria and seeing the playgrounds closed and closed off with yellow tape, um, the number of people in the grocery store wearing masks. Um, I've also taken pictures of, um, you know, signs, say it's beautiful signs that have been made by people in the community that are outside the hospital saying thank you. Um, you know, as healthcare workers, a lot of us I'm just going to tell you, we don't really feel like heroes. I know the, the, the uh, theme is, is heroes. We don't really feel like heroes. We kind of feel like we do this every day. Um, but, you know, it's really nice when people acknowledge what we do every day. Um, and, and obviously, we're doing a lot more right now by those types of, of gestures. I've taken a lot of pictures of the, of the beautiful artwork that people have put outside the hospital to thank us with um, you know, rainbows and rainbow hearts and um, really, really amazing things. I think we'll also see those images of, you know, numerous um, ambulances outside of New York hospitals, um, just, you know, the, the number of people who are in gowns, gloves, masks, face masks, um, it's just so different than what our usual activities are. Mm. 
Those are just great examples of kind of visually arresting images of this time that are, are so unique. And I think one thing for sure is that imagery, including illustration and photography and uh, many other art forms, uh, really carries a power that words can never really convey. So I think the power of the image is something that we, um, you know, feel very strongly carries us through various points in time and encapsulates, in, you know, various historical moments, um, which this certainly is one. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we can't thank you enough, Dr. Bradway, for being with us today. Uh, it added so much to the conversation about Rockwell's images and also the current time and, and what, what we can all expect uh, in the months ahead. And, um, and we also thank everyone who tuned in. Um, these were wonderful questions that came in today, and uh, we're extremely eager to see you again next time. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, Dr. Bradway. My pleasure.